Right. Um, first of all, I'd just like to point out that I'm going to be <coughs> dealing pretty much with the flip side of what we've already heard. So archaeology has some very positive aspects, uh, it can have, but it can also have some very negative aspects as well. Um, so I'd just like to point out that I've only got eight slides, but a couple of them are quite graphic of um, bodies. So anybody who's squeamish, then please be warned. So uh, Gail and I have a, a relatively similar background. And that's why uh, she very kindly asked me to stand in for her today. Um, I trained initially as an archaeologist. I worked for 10 years or so as a, as a field archaeologist with Oxford and Wessex, um, English Heritage. I did the rounds back in the, in the 90s. Um, and I was developing a, a very nice specialism in archaeological glass. And I thought, you know, things were just settling down and I was going somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and then I met uh, one of the proponents of forensic archaeology in the UK, Professor John Hunter who was also a glass specialist. Um, and I became aware of forensic archaeology and I thought, that's interesting. Um, also at the time, back in 1999, uh, I became more aware of the international work that was being done by archaeologists, particularly in the Balkans, after the Balkan War. Um, and I thought, how amazing wouldn't it be to use my skills to do something so important. Um, and luckily, uh, I was in the right place at the right time. I was able to take a place on the United Nations forensic team uh, as archaeologist and surveyor. And I went out to Bosnia to work on mass graves. So. For three seasons, I was very lucky to be re-employed by the UN. Um, it was always touch and go. You never thought whether somebody else might get the job. Um, and I worked in Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, Croatia, Serbia, um, digging up dead bodies and using my skills as an archaeologist uh, and surveyor. I was very proud to be doing that. But working in the UN was very much a bubble. They're, they're a, a huge organisation. They're very well organised. Uh, they do welfare very well, generally, certainly physical welfare. Um, and you're in a team. You don't interact outside that team, not really. Um, and everything's jolly. Um, following that, I became an archaeologist with the International Commission on Missing Persons in Sarajevo, Bosnia. And I spent two years there as a sole archaeologist in Bosnia. I had a colleague who was working in Serbia. Uh, and then things started to get a bit more difficult when you're working on your own. Things aren't as easy. Certain things can be tougher. People can be difficult. Um, you don't have the, the, the team network and support that you've loved before. Uh, <clears throat> following that, I um, took a, a very temporary position with the Foreign Office in Iraq. I spent three months scared shitless in Baghdad and thinking, why on earth am I here? So I came back from that, slightly more scarred than before, uh, but still wanting to do forensics, still wanting to do the humanitarian work. Um, <clears throat> I dabbled, dabbled. I spent a, a few months in Cyprus with the UN, um, and then I was doing glass work. Um, but I, <clears throat> I still wanted to carry on. Um, it's all encompassing and nothing else exists outside that. Nothing gives you the buzz <coughs> as working in those kind of environments. Adrenaline filled, you're always thinking on your feet. Um, and 
Although I was finding it more difficult, I still wanted to carry on. So I took a job for three years in Kosovo, working for the European Union, uh, and I was a member of a very small team. Um, and for the most part, it was okay, but things started to go really downhill at that point. Um, and that was a bit more difficult. But anyway, so <clears throat> I want to try and show you some of the things that people working in this kind of arena have to face, have to come to terms with, and have to deal with. And it's not easy because you don't get mental support. You get practical support, you get clean water, you get accommodation, uh, you get bussed out to site, you know, you don't have to worry about a lot of things, but there's very little consideration taken, taken into account for the mental effect, that, an emotional effect that these, these uh, activities can, can give you. So, let's move on. Oh yeah, I, for a long time, and I'm only just beginning to not think along those lines, is that I saw my life as two very different things. So before 1999, I was just a la -di da naive young woman, having fun on sight. And then post-1999, I didn't know what I was anymore. Um, a very different person. It can change you. Can change you in ways that people don't, um, you know, your family doesn't doesn't know really who you are anymore, doesn't know what to say to you. So uh, <clears throat> I'm just beginning to, to come out of that now. So let me move on. So Right, so some of the things that have an immediate and hard-hitting impact and that can have both immediate and long-term effects. Um, this is a image of the first series of mass graves I worked on in 99, and the guy standing there looking at it is a, one of the um, tribunal investigators. And I remember having a discussion with him at that time as we both looked at this mess this water-filled, sodden mess, because it had rained heavily the night before. Um, and wondering, what on earth does this mean? What, what is the value of human life? And that very thought is absolutely devastating. What, who could do that to other people? Uh, and I remember thinking that it was very much like looking into or through the gates of hell. I, 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 how, do you, how do you process that information and still be able to carry on? But you do. <clears throat> so this is uh, an image, I think, from probably 1996, or one of the first mass graves that was worked upon by one of the first teams that actually went out to Bosnia. This is a primary mass grave. Um, the bodies are white because that's the decomposition process, that's it's called adipocere, it's like soap. Um, and these are the guys working on it, this exposed mound of, of bodies. Um, so the smell and process of decomposition is also something that takes a lot of getting used to and takes a lot of getting used to uh, and can be horrific in itself. Uh, in Kosovo we were exhuming bodies less than a year in the ground so of course they weren't fully decomposed either. Um, it depends so much on the, the ground environment as to what condition you find the bodies in. Um, certainly, because of the way that uh, bodies are actually compressed, you'll get um, differential decomposition as well. So one body may have be skeletonized, 
but may have a mummified hand. So there's all kinds of different elements that you have to face that you've never had to face before. I mean, I worked on a lot of skeletons in my time in traditional archaeology, and uh, they never bothered me. But this is something different. So hair and nails can take a long time to decompose, so you're dealing with um, beards and um, fingernails. Um, yeah, and um, this is a precursor to the next image I'm going to show you, which um, is possibly the worst one. Um, features may still be present in a face face uh, composed purely of adipocere and I want to show you this photograph for a reason other than that. Um, this guy is called Bill Hagland, he was um, he used to work for Physicians for Human Rights, he was a proponent again of forensic archaeology in um, post-conflict countries um, and I looked at this photograph this weekend and I thought <coughs> this man is not looking after himself. He's, um, he's cradling that body as if he wants to hug it. And I recognise that. Um, I recognise that in him. So he, he, I think he feels more for the bodies than he does for himself and more for his fe fellow human beings. So I think he is a guy that's lost, lost in it. And I know that he, um, he worked for probably his entire life doing this, so it meant a great deal to him. But that's, that's not a healthy photograph. Um, everything you see is a highly emotive image. Um, I can see lots of images in my brain and memories that will probably never go away that have affected me. Um, so you saw a mass grave in its entirety. Um, this is a, a, a pair of bodies, but sometimes you can see from the position of a body how he died. Sometimes, as in this case, this little grave was hand dug, and you know that the guys that are in it are the people that dug it. So there's, it's very um, hard-hitting stuff but <clears throat> and you have to use your you know your systematic excavation and so on and so forth which is possibly one of the ways that you can deal with it is going through the, the typical archaeological process of excavation um, personal items Plenty of personal items from plastic lighters through ID cards, um, school notebooks, money kept in shoes, um, a sanitary towel in a jam jar, which in itself tells you that you potentially got a woman within the grave as well. And then your brain goes in certainly lots of different ways. Um, this watch, I, I put this one up because in 1999 I, I encountered my first kinetic watch. It was on the wrist of a dead person, but I <coughs> remember the um, investigators being very excited because as it was a kinetic watch, it had stopped at approximately the time of death. So it was really good for the case. But from 1999 onwards, I never wore a watch again. And I still don't wear a watch. Uh, my concept of time is very grey. Well, I'm glad to say I was here on time. So, yeah, images of innocence before violation and life before death. Heavy words, but that's there. Emotive images have long-term effects. They become part of daily or recurring thought patterns or changes in behaviour. 
Um, this is one of the grows I was felt very personally responsible for um, while I was working for the commission in Bosnia. Um, that's about the size of the team, and that is almost the size of the grave. So it was about two meters deep. Um, trying to get archaeology across to non-archaeologists um, is it was very difficult, and I had I was constantly fighting my corner for the archaeological process because bodies are so emotive. Certain people think, why do you want to deal with the archaeology? What on earth? Why is that important? What does that tell us? We just need to get those bodies out and back to families. We need to get them identified and back to families. And I would bang on to say, if you're systematic about it, you can see that you've got different depositions. Archaeologically, you can you follow the grave edge and you know that's your, the extent of what you've, you've got. Um, and these are very basic concepts, but very difficult for some other people to, to grasp. So, trying to get that archaeological process across is, can, be, can be difficult. Um, and of course we were recording all the remains as well, which is another matter that increased time, so people complained about that. Um, come on, we need to do it. You're, you're looking at a, I think it was six depositions, all jumbled up. Um, you want to make sure you get the best, best identification process going. You need to do it systematically, you need to record, you need to get your inventory. Um, but again, that, was, uh, that could be a bit of a battle. I'm sure I'm going over time. Right? It doesn't worry you, fine. Um, the other reason for this photo is, um, yeah, the deposition methodology is again something that can be quite hard hitting the first time you come across it. In the end, you can turn it into an intellectual um, thought process, but it has a has an effect. Um, so this is the same grave, but looking from the other end, <coughs> and you can see the original truck marks coming down. You know, they put all the bodies in, they drove the truck right over them to flatten them. Um, archaeology can pick all this up, if it's allowed to. Um, and then maybe just to clear a picture of exactly what people are faced with. Um, and the, the sheer complexity and difficulty of trying to unravel that and to remove remains in a very systematic way. Um, one of the modus operandi for the Serbian forces was to um, to rob primary graves. So this is a picture showing the, the robbed area. You'll be able to see the, the teeth marks of the, the, the machine that, that was used to do that. Um, again, archaeology plays its role. It's, it's important, certainly, for um, uh, the, the investigation as well. But you, there's, there's been a, a conflict between humanitarian recovery and forensic recovery. Um, and I don't know whether that's still ongoing, but it's certainly big, big in, in my time. So, moving on. Relief. Um, additional considerations that have an effect. Um, yeah, you're witness to um, a country that's in grief. Is the whole country is grieving? Individuals are grieving. The whole country. You can feel it palpably, um, and you have to show respect for that in respect to the people that you, you meet and you work with, you're constantly aware that um, people, find it, uh, people are finding it very difficult. Uh, 
And also, you 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 can feel that you're you're not allowed to show emotion or distress because you didn't go through what those other people went through. You've got no idea what they're feeling now, or you know, having lost loved ones. You do, you just don't know. Um, <clears throat> bodies are highly charged political tools. Well, that's very true. They can be bought and sold. Um, knowing that there are political games played around things makes things harder. Local perception to international support can be negative. That's true, I've experienced, it, experienced that. Um, you can be seen to be interfering, um, bringing process when you don't need process, um, maybe undermining a political figure in some way who makes things more emotive, um, all number of things. And also, you're getting a lot of money and they have nothing. You're, you're gaining from our suffering. And that, that's certainly true. A lot of, you know, people went out there to do their higher degrees. They got PhDs, went out there for two weeks and suddenly their CV was, was very hot stuff. And so it, it's certainly open to abuse from internationals. Um, always dealing with a minimal budget and resources and continually thinking on the hoof. That went without saying. Um, Being a visitor in a post-conflict country, you're witness to a level of hardship and deprivation that you yourself have never experienced. And you don't experience while you're there either. You can see it, but you know, you have enough money to buy the three meals, you have a hot house, you know, you're okay. Um, coming home from that can be very difficult as well. So coming back to Oxford near Christmas time from Warthorn, Kosovo, um, slightly surreal. Uh, language barrier can be an issue. Um, you need very good um, translators. Security might be under threat. Um, that's certainly been the case in the Balkans and in Iraq. Um, justifying the archaeological process. Everyone is an archaeologist. Everyone is an archaeologist. They'll all say, well, you should have just dug there. Or you dig deeper. Just keep digging deeper. You'll find it if you dig deep enough. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lack of, of general understanding. However much you try and simplify things or to make things logical, it's, uh, it never quite works. The dig deeper blues, we called it. Uh, conflicts between colleagues, bullying and sexism. When you're working in large international organisations such as the EU um, and others, you'll encounter all of that uh, and sometimes big style. Um, <clears throat> so, mitigating circumstances that can provide crucial support include a strong team. Um, I think for me that's of primary importance. It provides a strong support system um, and satisfies your need to belong. Um, and if you have very clear roles and you have respect and trust then that team can achieve anything. Do you need regular team discussions and debriefs? Uh, in, they need to be non-judgmental and open. Practical administ and administrative support. Um, it was okay in the UN, you had your equipment, your water, your lodgings. Uh, Administration made sure your pay was okay, sorted out your travel, um, but that was the UN. 
Inclusive social events, so you make sure that nobody's left out, you don't get cliques developing. On-site health and safety issues, very important as well. Um, certainly dealing with dead bodies, you have to be very aware of the risks. Um, things like heat as well, heat stroke, water, fresh water, um, body containment, you know, all of that kind of stuff has to be dealt with. Uh, access to medical service, services, um, certainly um, working for large organisations, the EU, UN, um, you will get medical access to probably military hospitals, that kind of thing. Otherwise, you know, you probably have to return to the UK, so that can be very different. Um, There was a couple of occasions during the years with the UN that they sent out a psychologist. Um, I don't, well, it, he was, you know, he wasn't a, um, a psychologist that was going to stay with us. He came out to just have a look. Uh, he was very short term, he's a very nice man. Um, and he tried to instigate some group discussions and we had some individual discussions, but he was up against two things, really, which I, well, I think the two main things. So he was already trying to, to talk to a group of anaesthetized practitioners with strong coping mechanisms, um, and also a sense of macho-ness. Um, I can't show I'm weak, um, I'm really strong, and I really don't need therapy, I'm okay. So uh, I'm not sure, wasn't sure about to, to say this, but I, I will. Um, although on the surface I had a relatively successful career, a small part of me knew that I was not going to be able to sustain it. Uh, and I finally cracked for good at the end of my third year in Kosovo and returned to the UK at the end of 2011, feeling totally exhausted and realising I was probably completely burnt out. And burnout is one of the big symptoms of this kind of work, or any humanitarian work, anything like that. Um, I also had some mental issues, including an ongoing empathy for victims of violent death. I felt overwhelming feelings of loss and emotional death at any mention of it, any mention or images of violent death, even roadkill. Uh, this was pervasive throughout my daily life and continued to overwhelm me. My coping mechanisms during the latter years of this work in Kosovo were to emotionally cut off, uh, totally disassociate and to isolate myself. Um, and I still see myself as recovering from that and I work very hard at it because I want to come back to life. I don't want my life to revolve around dead bodies. Regular therapy and healing with a professional has been crucial. I also do yoga. It well, was wonderful. Um, uh, I wanted to say, I'm, I, having written this, I <clears throat> want to put it out there. I have a big concern for students um, and new graduates from forensic courses or anybody who wants to go into this sort of work, that there is no preparation. Um, from recent experience in the UK, I know that these kind of people have been, have been involved in work they shouldn't have been involved in, um, and it really made me quite, quite upset. So I wonder what universities are now doing. Because it was so trendy, you know, everybody wanted to do forensic stuff, it was sexy, um, but it's not, it has a very, very um, difficult side to it. Um, and also another final note, um, I had the very lucky opportunity to work with a, a group of um, retired people who were called the Friends of Clarendon Palace and they work together to 
um, maintain and uh, study our old royal palace down near Salisbury, um, which is a, a ruin covered in grass and llamas. Um, and they were, they were just lovely, and they managed to get enough money together to do four weeks of field work, um, and I was lucky enough to, to go along there, and it was the most relaxing, therapeutic time I've ever had. And they were just the nicest people I'd met for a long time. They didn't expect anything of me, they just let me be me, they appreciated me for who I was, and no pressure, no competition, no egos, and that was seriously good therapy. So I fully endorse what you're trying to do when you do. So that's that.